This piece discusses death, murder, and people's disappearances. These are very serious issues. Please listen with discretion. Then Yahweh answered Job, out of the whirlwind. Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the earth in its width? Declare, if you know it all, In the spring of 1990, in the city of Nishinomiya, Japan, children began disappearing. Then one particular ten-year-old boy named Nobuyuki Yamazaki disappeared, and shortly after, so did his fifteen-year-old sister, Natsuko. The disappearances ended soon after that, but none of these children, twelve in total, were ever found, despite an exerted search effort that lasted for years. Early on, police investigators found a floppy disk belonging to Nobuyuki. On it were a collection of scary stories. The last of these stories said that there is a child with strange eyes named Makio, who appears in the park at midnight. Makio will ask you to play, and if you agree to play with Makio, then he will take you. The story went on to detail how each missing child was taken by Makio in this manner. Most notable was its account of Natsuko, Nobuyuki's older sister, who the story describes as its very own author. She wrote the story, or so the story itself goes, and saved it on her brother's floppy as a prank. Several of Natsuko's schoolmates who were questioned verified this, each saying independently that Natsuko told them that she had made up the story but that they didn't believe her. But the story also said that as the disappearances progressed, Natsuko saw that someone or something was changing the story. Details were being added to it, such as the names of the children who were disappearing. Who then really wrote the story on the floppy disk? Was it Nobuyuki? Was it Natsuko? Both of these options seem unlikely. What we can say for certain is that Makio is not real. At least not the Makio as described in the story. This Makio would have been made up by Natsuko, and then appeared in real life. Surely a fictional character cannot take over the life of a real character. Natsuko is the character of a person who lived, and Makio is a character who was somehow made up. Those are the facts, right? But in truth, those are not the facts, exactly. Natsuko Yamazaki and her little brother are also made up. This entire story is an urban fable, originating from a segment on the first episode of the fictional anthology TV series that began airing in 1990, Yonimo Kimyo na Monogatari, or Tales of the Bazaar. The original segment, Uwasa no Makio, was written by Masashi Todayama and directed by Mamoru Hoshi. I've altered the story for effect. That being said, Natsuko did pull Makio out of her own imagination, and still Makio managed to manifest in Natsuko's reality, and then take her. Does this mean that Makio could also manifest in our reality, and take us? Do monsters like Makio exist? Welcome. I'm Telesma Pluwar. The Lilaita Xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
But for this part, let's set the stranger monsters aside. Let's start with the basics. Unlike Machio, the Beast of Gévaudan was real and really did take people's lives. They were said to be large and to have had a stripe down their back, and they frequently tore out the throats of their victims. But nobody knows for certain who this monster was. We only know that they were indeed some monster who killed nearly 100 people from 1764 to 1767 in the rural area of southern France, called Gévaudan. Though they did also attack men, they mostly targeted women and children. The most common explanation is that they were some type of wolf or wolves, but this is not the only explanation people have proposed. Others have included a hyena, a lion, a Tasmanian tiger, a human or group of humans, and so on. One hypothesis... One hypothesis is even that a group of well-to-do serial killers used a wolf-mastiff hybrid to hunt peasants and they tied a boar's hide to the creature for armor. According to historian J.M. Smith, the most likely explanation was that they were actually two or more human-eating wolves. Their heightened public profile he links to the social context of France at that time. Political journalism was largely censored by King Louis XV, Smith argues. The country was in political and economic turmoil just after the Seven Years' War, and wolf attacks were being utilized by newspapers as both an outlet for public anxieties and as political propaganda. And according to rural historian Jean-Marc Morisot, wolf attacks were not so uncommon a problem in Europe, especially immediately following periods of human wars. So wolf attacks were a real phenomenon. Consider how it would have felt to be raising your family or to be a child living in Gévaudan at this time, to know for real that this killer was out there, and that it could be you that they attacked next. The threat ended suddenly in 1767, and then over the years, wolf attacks in France petered out altogether as the wolves were hunted and their populations dwindled in the 19th and 20th centuries. But human eaters are not restricted to 18th century wolves. Biologist Carl Hans Tacke has concluded that the beast of Gévaudan was actually an imported lion, and certainly lions will begin hunting humans as their main source of prey, even in contemporary times. For example, two lions on the Tsavo River in Kenya killed some 35 people during the building of a railroad bridge at the end of the 19th century. Another infamous example, the Lion of Mufuwe killed some six people in the Lawanga River Valley in Zambia in 1991. This monster was a male three meters or ten feet in length. Their taxidermy body is now on display, along with the Tsavo human eaters at the Field Museum in Chicago. Can you hunt the prey for the lioness, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in the thicket? Who provides for the raven his prey when his young ones cry to God and wander for lack of food? Who has set the wild donkey free, or who has loosened the bonds of the swift donkey whose home I have made the wilderness and the salt land his dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city, neither does he hear the shouting of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture. He searches after every green thing. Will the wild ox be content to serve you, or will he stay by your feeding trough? Can you hold the wild ox in the furrow with his harness, or will he till the valleys after you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave him to your labor? 
will you confide in him that he will bring home your seed and gather the grain of your threshing floor. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the feathers and plumage of love? For she leaves her eggs on the earth, warms them in the dust, and forgets that the foot may crush them, or that the wild animal may trample them. She deals harshly with her young ones, as if they were not hers. Though her labor is in vain, she is without fear. Because God has deprived her of wisdom, neither has he imparted to her understanding. When she lifts up herself on high, she scorns the horse and his rider. Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and stretches her wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the cliff he dwells and makes his home, on the point of the cliff and the stronghold. From there he spies out the prey. His eyes see it afar off. His young ones also suck up blood. Where the slain are, there he is. Then there is the Red Devil, Diablo Rojo, probably named for the rapid bright red pulses they sometimes produce, as well as for their aggressiveness. These carnivorous sea monsters can grow to about 50 kilograms or 110 pounds, and a total length of 2.5 meters, which is over 8 feet. They form shoals of over a thousand. The long appendages arrayed around their mouth are armed with hundreds of suckers, each containing a ring of pointy teeth that are easily able to that are easily able to lacerate a person's skin. When hungry, they are known to eat each other, sometimes forming a large mass called a squid ball, and they eat with a strong, sharp beak the size of a human hand. They are also called the Humboldt squid or jumbo flying squid. Their scientific name is Dositicus gigas. They belong to the family Omastrephidae, nicknamed flying squid because of some of its members' ability to glide above the water. A squid's mantle, the main portion of their body, acts as a water pump, which can propel them through the water at high speeds. The literal flying squids use jet propulsion to shoot out of the water and then shape themselves into gliders and glide through the air at up to 88 kilometers per hour. And juvenile Humboldt squid have been observed flying at night, possibly to evade larger Humboldt squid attempting to cannibalize them. There's even one report of a full-grown Humboldt squid jet propelling out of the water and gliding very briefly. Aside from brilliant red and pale white, they have a variety of other red and white patterns that they use for largely unknown reasons. They even appear to mimic patterns of sunlight to camouflage themselves. For this study, we looked at natural chromogenic displays in free-swimming Dicidicus gigas, also known as the Humboldt squid. We employed the use of National Geographic's animal-borne video package CritterCam to observe chromatophore use in this species. All cephalopods use chromatophores to change color, but very little is known about chromatophore use in pelagic squid due to the difficulties in studying them in their natural environment. Cameras were attached to two squid during the day in the Gulf of California, which recorded without the use of any artificial lights. The animals were able to swim freely with the cameras for two to four hours, after which the cameras detached automatically and were retrieved at the surface. Through these deployments, we identified a dynamic display we termed flashing, in which the entire animal's body rapidly changed from red to white, creating a strobing effect. This, we believe, is likely a form of communication, as it was only ever observed in the presence of other squid. The squid exhibited control over the frequency of the flashes, as well as the phase relationship of their flashes to those of other squid, indicating there may be information contained in these characteristics. Another dynamic display was termed flickering, and is much more irregular and subtle than the flashing. We believe this is a type of camouflage, as the flickering of the chromatophores appears very similar to downwell bite in the water column, as observed on the squid when at the surface. Humboldt squid flicker and flash, the company of biologists 2015, 
CCBY 3.0 license. The Humboldt squid spend much of their time in deep waters, and their typical range is in the tropics of the eastern Pacific from Mexico to Peru, but shoals do typically spend time near the surface at night. Furthermore, over the past 30 years, they have expanded their territory with regular populations along the coast of California. During periods of El Nino, when the Pacific Ocean becomes warmer for several years, people have observed them as far north as Alaska and as far south as Tierra del Fuego. This expansion is likely due to climate change and to decrease in top-level predators such as shark and tuna. There are reports of attacks on humans. Scott Cassell, explorer, filmmaker, and counterterrorism operative, said that a squid bit his head and then broke his wrist in five places. At one time, Cassell boasted that out of an estimated 2,000 dives with the squid, he has been attacked roughly 1,000 times. Another alarming reported behavior is their attempts to pull scuba divers into deeper waters, as in the case of marine biologist Alex Kerstich, who was reportedly attacked by three of the squid and badly injured off Baja, California in 1990. But are they really human eaters, as some would claim? It's certainly plausible, if extremely rare. A 2010 catalog of cephalopod species produced by the UN states, quote, Several reports exist of attacks on humans by large Dracidicus gigas, including at least one death. Unquote. I have not managed to verify this reported death. Maybe it really happened? By comparison, in the United States from 1959 to 2010, 26 people died in total because of shark attacks, and 1,970 people were killed by lightning strikes. There were 31 people murdered in Alaska, 1,811 people murdered in California, and an estimated 14,748 people murdered in all of the U.S. just in the year 2010 alone. While there are those that claim the Red Devils do attack humans, especially at night, at other times the squid are known to behave in a way that is benign and curious. I reached out via email to briefly question Dr. Ruidosa, marine ecologist and head of the Ruidosa lab specializing in marine ecology, which is based at the Laboratorio Maritimo da Guia in Cascais, Portugal. Rosa said that he has never heard of the Humboldt squid attacking people and that he was surprised to hear of a person being killed by them. I asked him about the reports of attacks and all of the TV shows that feature videos of squid attacking people. And he said that people will chum the waters, meaning that they will dump fish food overboard, and then they will dive in the water. This way, the squid will behave more aggressively for the camera. This paints a very different picture from the one described by Scott Cassell. Is Dr. Rosa, who is an expert in both marine biology and marine ecology, simply unaware of squid attacks? Is Scott Cassell exaggerating? Does Scott Cassell just tend to provoke the squid? Are these questions overly suggestive? Or are the squid only aggressive under particular circumstances, causing different pictures of their behavior to emerge to the public? These are all questions I refuse to answer for you. But what I can say is that while it is possible that the Humboldt squid could kill a person, they are not known to do so hardly ever, if at all. It's also worth noting that the Red Devils are definitely attacked and hunted by humans. In fact, they are the most hunted squid in the world. According to an article from Seafood Source, the jumbo flying squid fishery off the western coast of South America is, quote, the single most important squid fishery in the world, unquote. Illegal fishing boats, fishing fleets from China and other East Asian countries, and fishing fleets from Latin America all heavily exploit this fishery. From 2009 to 2020, China's jumbo flying squid catch alone has jumped from 70,000 to 385,000 metric tons. As a result of all of this, these jumbo flying squid are under threat 
because of the humans overfishing them. Are the Red Devils monsters? In my opinion, yes. But as I'll discuss in the future, I strictly mean that they are monsters in a lovable way, like Pokemon. Except you definitely do not gotta catch them all. Not all monsters deserve to be hated. Many deserve awe and respect. Some of us are even proud to call ourselves monsters. Are the Humboldt squid mysterious? Yes. Are they terrifying and strange? I don't think I need to answer that question. But what is most captivating about them is that they are entities with mortal organic bodies living in the natural world, just as humans are. They deserve compassion. Moreover, they are not the sort of monster that is known to kill humans, let alone actively hunt them. And indeed, as is so often the case, it is the humans who are the far more deadly monster. It is the humans who cannot stay their hand, and who, like children, press the scale until it breaks. In this episode, I'm focusing mostly on monsters who everyone agrees exist. I am saving the discussion of cryptids, the legendary monsters and creatures, for another day. However, when speaking of cryptids, academic and author Colin Dickey wrote something that is relevant to us here. Quote, these creatures do not exist for our own symbolic matrix. Just as geologic evidence of the real quote-unquote Lemuria has little to do with the mythical civilizations of Lemuria, the new species discovered constantly by scientists have no symbolic meaning for ourselves as the natural world once did. Our disappointment with the natural world has to do with the fact that it no longer serves to reflect back our values and fears to us. Moving away from cryptids involves more than just a reaffirmation of objective science and verifiable evidence. It will take reconceptualizing the world away from a sense that man and his god are at the center of all things, and that all things exist to reflect us back to ourselves." Unquote. Well put, although I don't think I entirely agree. I, for one, don't really think that man or his god are at the center of things, and I never really have. Now humans do like to make themselves look big by putting themselves all together in one completely unwieldy mass, a sort of human ball, and then each attempting to climb to the very top and declare themselves ruler over all. But they have always seemed to be quite powerless, insignificant, and small to me. Granted, I do think Dickie means to be talking only about the perspective of humans. Even still, I would argue most humans, be they Pleistocene hunter-gatherers, medieval peasants, prisoners, office workers, monks, or what have you, would agree with me. Most humans have the sense that they are out on the edges of this world. Even we non-human entities who just have a human stink about us have this feeling about ourselves. So the wisest thing to do is to just accept it. Regular human Emily Dickinson, who I never met, wrote, Nobody knows this little rose. It might a pilgrim be. Did I not take it from the ways and lift it up to thee? Only a bee will miss it. Only a butterfly, hastening from far journey, on its breast to lie. Only a bird will wonder. Only a breeze will sigh. Ah, little rose, how easy for such as thee to die. Why is the rose a pilgrim when it is just sitting and growing in one spot? Who is the rose being offered to? A living person? A person who has passed? Some other entity? In any case, all who die can relate to the rose. To be always only where they are amongst so many others much like them, and then to always pass away into nothing. 
Like most roses, most mortal beings are also forgotten. I suppose in some sense, even I am like this. It doesn't matter what sort of being you are, human, monster, as long as you can deal in symbols, as long as you have some brains, there is a lot of symbolic power in every creature, not least monsters. And even if they are not known to hunt or kill people, the tentacled monsters of the deep still hold our imaginations captive. What is reflected back on the sailor who gazes into the plate-sized eye of a giant squid? When a human gazes at a great white shark, what does that shark see? Moreover, Yahweh answered Job, Shall he who argues contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered Yahweh, Behold, I am of small account. What will I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. Now brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Will you even annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like him? Now deck yourself with excellency and dignity. Array yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the fury of your anger. Look at everyone who is proud and bring him low. Look at everyone who is proud and humble him. Crush the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in the hidden place. Then I will also admit to you that your own right hand can save you. See now, Behemoth, which I made as well as you. He eats grass as an ox. Look now, his strength is in his thighs. His force is in the muscles of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He who made him gives him his sword. Surely the mountains produce food for him, where all the animals of the field play. He lies under the lotus trees, in the covert of the reed, and the marsh. The lotuses cover him with their shade. The willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if a river overflows, he doesn't tremble. He is confident, though the Jordan swells even to his mouth. Shall any take him when he is on the watch? or pierce through his nose with a snare. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook, or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope into his nose, or pierce his jaw through with a hook? Will he make many petitions to you, or will he speak soft words to you? Will he make a covenant with you, that you should take him for a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you bind him for your girls? Will traders barter for him? Will they part him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle, and do so no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Won't one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that he dares stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Everything under the heavens is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs, nor his mighty strength, nor his goodly frame, 
Who can strip off his outer garment? Who will come within his jaws? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. Strong scales are his pride. Shut up together with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined to one another. They stick together so that they can't be pulled apart. His sneezing flashes out light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning torches. Sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils a smoke goes, as of a boiling pot over a fire of reeds. His breath kindles coals. A flame goes out of his mouth. There is strength in his neck. Terror dances before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him. They can't be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yes, firm as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. They retreat before his thrashing. If one attacks him with the sword, it can't prevail. Nor the spear, the dart, the pointed shaft. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow can't make him flee. Sling stones are like chaff to him. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rushing of the javelin. His undersides are like sharp pot shirts, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. He makes the deep to boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He makes a path shine after him. One would think the deep had white hair. On earth, there is not his equal that is made without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Then Job answered Yahweh, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be restrained. You asked who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered that which I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me which I didn't know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Monsters are not only real, they are common, because many monsters are just physical organisms. There are those that are benign, like great blue whales, giant isopods, tardigrades, or what have you. These monsters are beautiful and have fantastic characteristics. The corpse of a dead great blue whale, for example, forms its very own habitat on the seafloor. Beautiful monsters also play important roles in the world and are all invaluable to the world of life. All living beings may fall into this category in some sense. Or almost all, at least. But then there are the monsters that are justifiably scary. Crocodiles, venomous spiders, rabid dogs, parasitic nematodes, infectious bacteria, Viruses, human murders, creatures specialized to exploit the flesh of others. And monsters are actually important to understand, especially the ones that are nearest to us. Those that existed in times past or in distant lands spark our imagination. They're spooky, kooky, and ooky. They're fun to think about. But those that are close at hand are slippery, difficult to deal with, seemingly impossible to comprehend, and anxiety-inducing. They can be truly terrifying. They can be real threats. And they are frequently related to tragic events and the resulting human trauma. A trauma is a lasting injury to a being's mind and soul often caused by experiences of death, violence, abuse, and war. In the rare instances that squid do attack people, like marine biologist Alex Kerstich, the experience can be potentially traumatizing. 
There is also trauma surrounding the killings and maulings by human-eating predators like lions, wolves, sharks, and what have you. And there is trauma in the way that humans globally hunt and exploit squid and other life at a scale that is far greater than even the most prolific human killers, which tragically happen to also be humans. Though not all humans may be monsters, it seems that most traumatic monsters in the natural world are humans. as humans appear to cause the most trauma. The biblical character of Job witnesses his children and servants die, and then he is afflicted with boils covering his skin. Any person in these circumstances would be traumatized. And Job's God is depicted as quite monstrous, if not a monster himself. He speaks out of a whirlwind. He is the creator not only of Job's arbitrary suffering, but also the terrifying and kaiju-esque behemoth and leviathan, not to mention the world itself. The behemoth and leviathan may be likened to a degree with natural beasts, Perhaps something like crocodiles, large predatory sharks, or a prehistoric animal such as a predatory dinosaur or mosasaur. Such a creature could potentially be traumatizing if encountered in real life. But the behemoth and leviathan also have fantastical characteristics, like fire-breathing ability and total invulnerability. The Leviathan is a cosmic sea serpent that is to be killed at the end of time, according to Isaiah 27 verse 1, and it is related to other mythological sea monsters, like the Lotan in Canaanite mythology. God in the book of Job is powerful enough to create any creature possible, even mythological dragons that only God can kill. God is the mother of all monsters. He is described as reaching far beyond all human wisdom and comprehension. Not far off, it seems, from Lovecraft's great old ones. Job could never possibly question such a being's intentions. One may argue that this depiction of God is antiquated, as there is now a modern understanding of the world steeped in centuries of formal science. But science reveals to us not only knowledge about the world, but also knowledge of the vast mysteries of the world. Scientists have learned that both time and space are extremely vast, so vast that they cannot possibly be fully explored by humans. While people may today have a much more advanced understanding of the world than ancient humans like Job, what people know about the universe and their own planet is still very small compared to what is unknown. Not only this, but humans still often cannot predict or prevent traumatic events, let alone always successfully ascribe meaning to them. As in the book of Job, humans often depict monsters as entities that are related to traumatic events and that extend beyond human control as well as understanding traumatizing monsters. They also don't usually have intentions that align with those of humans. Such monsters are commonplace in human stories and experiences. They range from gods and angels, to fairies, demons, monstrous beasts, aliens, harmful ghosts, yokai, cryptids, and so forth. However, just because an entity may be described by one of these terms, it doesn't mean they are necessarily a monster, or that they are real. In the next part, we will come to a working definition for the term monster that considers what a monster can be, different types of monsters, 
and ethical issues with the term monster. And just as we have done with the monsters mentioned in this part, in this series we will consider various cryptid monsters and highly strange monsters in relation to traumatic events like death, abuse, suffering, abduction, and predation. Even when monsters may not exist as organisms, or when they possess no physical body, they may still grow and change within the traumatized psyche of a person or a population. The question of the reality of such monsters is complicated and less clear than for known organisms. But while we will attempt to address it, it's also a less relevant question as the stakes can become very high. The more important question is, how can our understanding of monsters help prevent humans and other life forms from harm? This was part one of the Depth Parade, a fuzzy gray tendril inside the Earth. In part two, cryptids. What are they? Are they a threat? Thank you so much for listening. I bless your long sojourn in this place, that it may be kind to your feet. Do you want protection from the evil eye in the sky? Make sure to follow the Earth wherever you listen to your podcasts, and share it with your friends. Please also visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash welcome to the earth. We currently have no patrons, and we would like them. Patrons get special access to exclusive esoteric knowledge, and they get to chat with prehistoric ghosts. This work is created by Telesma Blue Orb, your psychopath in the swamp. Outside of her personal perspective as a literal monster, she has no professional expertise in the topics discussed. She is hosted by me, her fully consenting meat mind and human, Rachel Nelson. Yes, without this Rachel, I would not only have no human voice with which to speak, she has also allowed me to cohabitate her body for tens of thousands of hours during the podcast's development. Thank you, dear human. Are you kidding? Thank you. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Additional research with a stiff upper lip was provided by Ruth Y. Haversaw. Eyes on the ground by Sophie May Prim, car hop detective. Marcescent leaves cleave to by Edwin Undyne. Vile flowers bloomed unceasingly by... Knowledge of the Hearts of Celestial Chambers by Daimon Folksbuch Johnson. Special thanks to Mike Schott, Director Emeritus of the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, and to Dr. Rui Rosa, Principal Investigator at Rui Rosa Lab, based at the Laboratorio Maritimo de Quia, for answering our inquiries on Docidicus Gigas. The Earth's theme, Om Matrix, was created by Guy Merrill using Time Sound, and it was used with his permission. Om Matrix is copyright protected by Guy Merrill. Additional music by Mon Plaisir and Graphite 412 is in the public domain. Lunar Moth by Loco Mule. Spooky Dungeon by Memorophile at Your Perfect Studio. I'm Pathetica. Bottomless Pitman Boss and Bottomless Pitman Stage 1 by Spring Spring. Who are they? By Tad. And 8-Bit Cave Loop by Wolfgang came from opengameart.org and are all available for use under a Creative Commons or other copyleft license. An extensive bibliography of all textual and audio references for this episode can be found in the episode script, which is linked in the description. Most of them are freely available online. For more Internet Age urban legends like the story of Makio, check out Toshiden, Exploring Japanese Urban Legends by Tara A. Devlin. And remember, 
I am always here. Original People's Acknowledgement Many lands throughout the world have been colonized without the permission of those living there. This work is created in and around the Portland Basin region, which is the ancestral home of many different peoples. They include the Cowlitz, Klickitat, Molala, Tualatin, Clackamas, Katlamet, Multnomah, Wasco, and Wishram, among others. Many of their living descendants continue to make this place their home. We acknowledge that this is their land.